and welcome everyone today to the uh, webinar on uh, the program from R USDA Rural Development uh, called Rural Energy for America. It is a energy incentive uh, and grant program uh, through rural development. Uh, I am going to talk about a few other programs um, that are available, but the bulk of this presentation is about uh, Rural Energy for America or better known as REAP, uh, because you know that the federal government loves their acronyms. Uh, so yeah, this is the REAP program. And again, my name is Jim Johnson, and I work for the Small Business Development Center, uh, which is an SBA resource partner, and I work uh, at the University of South Carolina. Um, I've been with the SBDC for going on nine years now, and most of my time with SPDC has been spent working with rural small businesses and farms uh, and businesses in the food system, but also with sustainability and energy projects. Uh, one of the ways that I got into uh, working in energy is just through uh, being associated with so many rural uh, small business projects and getting to know USDA programs and eventually USDA rural development programs very well. Um, started helping folks with them um, many years ago and have probably been doing, have been helping write the REAP grant for, I guess, going on maybe eight years. Uh, so I've seen it go through some changes over the years. So now is actually a good time to, to participate with the REAP program. The SBDC is uh, basically free, uh, no charge uh, to individuals uh, in South Carolina, uh, confidential. So all discussions are confidential uh, once you sign up as a client with SBDC. Uh, SBDCs, are, you can find us all around the state. Um, we, we cover all 46 counties in South Carolina. Uh, we have over 20 centers throughout the state. Uh, I'm located in the Columbia Center on the campus of USC. Uh, and the uh, SBDC is, is great consultants. If you haven't engaged, I highly recommend um, talking to an SBDC consultant about your business. I happen to be a specialist, which means I focus a lot of my time and efforts on certain industries, agriculture, food systems, sustainability, energy. So I've become kind of a resident expert in those areas, uh, and I'm able to help folks walk through projects and uh, help with the, them with other aspects of the business. Some of the other activities that SPDC consultants may help with is business planning, uh, funding and financing, which what we're talking about today is an aspect of, of funding. Um, startup considerations, how to get started, uh, strategic planning, and, and the list goes on and on. So great resource. So you can just, you know, go to Google if you don't know. Of course, you've got, you got here today, so you're able to register with SBDC uh, for, the, for this webinar. So today we're going to talk about the Rural Energy for America program. And on the call, I have with us Rhonda Craven. Uh, Rhonda is with the USDA Rural Development. She is the state energy coordinator. And as you will see, uh, that is an, a, an important role uh, at the USDA in regard to the REAP program. She is your point of contact uh, for submitting applications, um, you know, communicating, uh, you know, on, on the grant opportunity um, before and after. Uh, so very important person. She's on here with us today to answer questions. I will be presenting the material and uh, helping answer questions as well. If I can, if, you know, it seems simple up front when you look at the program, but with any federal program or any grant program, when you start digging into the details of things, a lot, a lot of questions come up, okay? So we've heard a lot of questions and Rhonda knows a lot of the answers right off the bat. Other times we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to look them up. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll move on. So, how is the Rural Energy for America program funded? Uh, well, you know, there was a, uh, a bill that came out, a funding bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, 
uh, it came out and it it uh, funded an additional two point zero two billion dollars into the REIT program, and they hope uh, that this money will help invest into forty five thousand farms and small businesses over the next ten years. So this this fund that's REIT's been around for a while. This program, I'm gonna say, is probably fifteen years old, maybe. Um, so it's been around a long time, and uh, it's just always had a different iteration. So they, with this new funding, they, they've changed some of the regulations and rules to make it more appealing to rural small businesses. And in some in some cases, a little bit easier to apply uh, and get funding depending on, depending on the project. So what is REIT and what does it cover? So we're basically talking about two different types of projects that REAP covers. The first are renewable energy systems. The second are energy efficiency improvements. So they both have their acronyms to RES and EEI. So if you see that, if you go to their website and you look and you see these acronyms, that's, that's what they're talking about. So, um, and, and you can go either path. You can go both uh, in one fiscal year. Uh, you can apply for both, or you can apply for one or the other. Um, but just one, like RES per year, or one uh, uh, per year. So the next question that comes up, and when I work with uh, folks who are interested in applying for this grant, this is kind of the first part of you know the process: is am I eligible? Am I an eligible entity? And the second part, which you'll soon see, is do I have an eligible project? So to determine if you're an eligible entity, you can be uh, one of two types of entities here. You can be an agricultural producer, which means that uh, more than 50% of your gross income comes from agricultural production for the entity that's applying, right? Uh, so you need to make most of your money. The majority of your money has to come from agricultural production. Uh, and if you fall within the agricultural producer um, applicant, uh, then it doesn't matter where you are. You can be anywhere. You can be in the city, you can be an urban farmer, you can be in the country, either way, um, because you're an agricultural producer. Now, if you're not an ag producer and you're interested, then you can apply as a rural small business. Well, rural small business, a few more hoops that you have to jump through uh, to try to figure out if you're a rural small business. Um, the first is, do you fall within the SBA uh, small business standard guideline, right? So does the SBA see you as a small business? And we're going to have a couple slides here coming up that, that show you how to figure that out. Uh, the other idea is, are you in a rural area? And the USDA has created a map that you can go to to determine if you, you are actually in a rural area. And that will be on the next slide. So two ways you can determine if you're eligible. You have to be an agricultural producer or you have to be a real small business. If you want to determine if you're in an eligible area, uh, you can go to the map, um, the USDA eligibility map. And I'm just going to pull this over. I actually pulled it up. This is the site you would go to for USDA. You can Google it, USDA eligibility map and come right to it. Just make sure when you get to this map, they have a lot of programs, make sure you're in rural business and then make sure that you're looking under the REAP program here, see where it says REAP. So it's this top one. And then you go to your map and I am in Orangeburg. So I'm pretty sure um, that I am eligible. So I just typed in an address here, clicked it, and it says, yeah, this address is located in an eligible area. So I can check that box and say, hey, I'm in an eligible area. But you still have to determine if you're an eligible small business as well. But if you kind of zoom out of this map, you can see that Charleston, most of Charleston is not eligible. And most of Augusta, Columbia, uh, Greenville and Rock Hill, greater Charlotte area, 
these okay. are mostly all these are all in eligible areas so but you got to kind of look at it you know uh, but you can also see that most of south carolina is eligible yeah. good thing you and mom So the next uh, criteria to determine if you're a rural small business is to figure out if you are, if you meet the SBA size uh, standard requirements. And uh, the way to do that, you have to figure out what your NAICS code is, NAICS code, uh, which is the industry that you work in. If you're a manufacturer, you have a certain code. If you're a restaurant, you have a certain code. If you're a grocery store, you have a certain code. Um, you can look that up. You can actually Google that pretty much. Uh, but if you're working with somebody like me or a consultant, we can help you look that up. Um, and then you just go to the SBA site, uh, type in the code. They have a tool, SBA size standard tool. You know, type in that code and it'll come back and say, well, do you have under 500 employees? Then you're eligible. Um, and sometimes it might be based on revenues. So it just depends. Uh, but this tool is pretty easy to use. Uh, but that's basically the second threshold of determining if you're an eligible applicant. So it's pretty self-evident, but you'd be surprised. Uh, sometimes that's not so hard to decide if you're eligible or not, but that's what we're happy to do to help is uh, help you make that determination to see if you're an eligible applicant uh, and can move forward. So now you determine you're an eligible applicant. So what kind of projects? Are available. What what could what could I do with this grant? So yeah, going back to the eligibility of the project, uh, you have two paths basically, um, or two types of programs here. One is RES, renewable energy, and renewable energy projects include solar projects, uh, which is probably the most popular application submitted to to rural development on the RES side. Um, you have wind. Uh, small hydroelectric, anaerobic, biomass, geothermal, wave, ocean power. So a lot of different types of projects, but probably most folks are interested in solar. Um, it's the most accessible, I'd imagine, and probably one of the least expensive uh, methods uh, for for achieving, you know, renewable energy. But every project's different for people. It just depends on what your goals are. But these are all eligible projects, um, you know, from just looking at the project standpoint. So if you go to energy efficiency, uh, the product, you have a list of projects here. And lighting is probably one of the most popular and easiest ones, which usually makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of folks have uh, fluorescent lighting. You know, you just switch over to LED. Generally speaking, there's about 80% savings. Uh, in energy uh, by moving to the, from fluorescent to LED. Uh, so that's a huge savings. So that would score pretty well. Uh, and if it was a smaller project, it would score well. And we'll go through scores uh, a little bit later on this slide. But lighting is very popular. Heating, cooling, HVACs, uh, those type things, ventilation, fans, um, automated controls, insulation. And there's other stuff. So this is not an all-inclusive list. These are just probably some of the more popular energy efficiency projects. But the main thing or the main gist of the energy efficiency is, can you prove that there's going to be a net energy savings after you install this new piece of equipment or you finish this project? If you can prove through the project that it creates a net energy savings, it could be eligible. So I've seen I've seen some in the past with like window tinting, um, some other stuff like that. You know, uh, these these are proven methods to save energy, uh, so they could be eligible. Uh, so that's another thing you see this list. Another thing that I talk to a lot of people about are you know whether their project is eligible or not. So we kind of step through that and and figure it out. If I don't know, we could always go back to Rhonda Craven, the USDA. She doesn't know, she can go to Washington and uh, we will get an answer one way or another. These are some examples of projects um, that I've worked on um, in the past several years. Uh, solar solar project um, with an equestrian center for about 177,000. Uh, rural storage facility, a much smaller solar energy project. So solar energy doesn't have to be a huge project. It could be um, fairly small. 
Uh, it just has to be associated with the rural small business or or the farm. Uh, pumps for dairy farm, um, a chiller for a rural uh, nursing home, and lighting and automation for rural manufacture. But I've also worked with grocery stores and restaurants and and all types of other folks. Um, generally, the businesses or industries that have um, energy consuming devices or high energy consuming devices like restaurants you have all the refrigeration grocery stores you have a lot of refrigeration you know on farms you know, you have like poultry commercial poultry farms you're using big fans and a lot of lights and you know that's probably one of your highest expenses on your income statement for a commercial poultry farm but you know is there a considerable you know, energy bill, first of all, and, and does it make sense for you to um, make these improvements or, or get renewable energy systems to help replace energy or save energy? Uh, and that's another part of, you know, what we do as consultants whenever we work with people is, you know, trying to determine the feasibility of the whole project. Does it make sense? You know, um, do you want to lay out the cash, even though this is a grant, you'll see in momentarily how much it, it pays, um, you're still going to have put money out. Uh, it is a reimbursable grant, by the way. So you have to pay for the project. The project has to be in operation for 30 days. Then you can submit for reimbursement after that. So what are some eligible and ineligible project costs? Uh, so what could you spend the money on? If you, if you come up with the project, you know, whether it's a lighting project or HVAC or a solar project, you know, there are eligible and ineligible costs uh, when you're doing that. So on the eligible side, you can, you know, purchase equipment and have it installed, pay for the installation. Um, it can be new and refurbished. Um, post application construction and facility improvements, uh, retrofitting, professional service fees, um, like architecture, maybe, or some type of engineering and, and things like that. Permits and licensing um, are all eligible, right? Working capital land acquisition, they have a loan side to this as well, uh, which I'm not going to go into uh, as much, um, other than just to let you be aware that REAP uh, does has a, have a loan guarantee product. Um, so if you if you need the funding, you know, to uh, complete the project, there's a path that you can go through uh, through USDA to get that guarantee. Or you can choose, you know, your current relationship with the lender that you have now, or you can find other lenders. I mean, however you can access the capital. But um, they did create this loan, you know, for this purpose, if, if it was needed. Um, ineligible project cost. Uh, this is not for residential. These are for small businesses and farms. Um, can't use it to buy equipment like a tractor or tilling equipment or general use vehicle. You know, it's not for any of that. Um, no used equipment. So it does say refurbished, but refurbished with warranties and certifications and all that kind of stuff. Um, nothing pre, this is a big one. Ineligible pre-application construction and facility improvements are ineligible. So I come across this a good bit. And what this means is you have to have submitted your application to the USDA and they have to, you know, send you a notice that they've received it. Then they need to review your application and then they need to respond to you that you have uh, submitted a complete application. And basically what that means is they'll go through the application to look at it. If anything is missing, if anything just doesn't look, just doesn't comply with uh, USDA regulations, uh, they're going to send you a letter or a list of things back saying, this needs to be changed. You're missing this. You know, uh, this is an issue. Uh, and then you need to remedy those, correct those, send them back. And then once they're satisfied that you have a complete application, they'll send you a letter that's saying, okay, you have a complete application. You can proceed with your project. So you cannot spend, you cannot incur any costs before you get that letter that says it's complete. And then what incurring the cost means if you ordered the equipment and it's kind of like in route to your, your store, uh, well, you incur that cost. 
by ordering that equipment. So that's ineligible. So basically, you don't need to do anything with the project if you want this grant to help pay for it. Uh, you don't need to do anything with that project until you get a letter from the USDA saying your 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 um, application is complete and you're free. You're, you can proceed. So once you get that, everything that you've written in the grant after that, you know, could be eligible. Another another thing is, once they send you that letter that says it's complete, that's no guarantee of funding either. That's just saying they received a complete application. And if you want to start, it's still at your own risk. So you can start. They're not guaranteeing that you're getting the grant uh, or you're getting the funding. They're just saying, hey, we got the complete application. You're good. Now we'll score it. And then we'll determine if you can get the allocation and funding. Um, so you start you start the project at your own risk at that point. Um, some people do because they're going to do the project anyway. Other people want to wait to see if they got the allocation or the funding. Um, in that period of time, we'll talk about a, a little bit later. So I spent some time on that. Um, particular point, just because I've seen it happen in the past where people started the project already, and then it, you know, ended up being uh, an issue because now, you know, they couldn't really submit a grant for the portion that they are started. Uh, one thing you could do is you could still su still submit for the part you have not incurred any expenses on, which would be kind of a partial project funding. Um, so anyway, the best thing to do is to get a complete application, right? If you if you want to proceed with this before you do anything. Um, application preparation or grant writer fees, these are not eligible. So some folks, you can hire a private consultant and there are many out there who help write this grant. Uh, I just happen to do it for free because I work for a you know, SBA federal program with the university. So my, my services are free. I'm paid by the university. I'm a university employee. But you can hire someone to do it, and their fees vary. But their fees, you just have to pay those out of pocket. Those are not reimbursable. I can't use it for lines of credit, you know, pay, make lease payments, um, or to pay any type of uh, pay yourself as an owner. Um, those are all ineligible. And so now we have uh, deadlines. Uh, so this is this program is open year round to apply. It's a rolling open application, so you can apply. If you got all your stuff together today, we can apply tomorrow. Um, you know, so you can put put in the application anytime. But they have deadlines as to when they review these applications. So the next deadline coming up is March thirty first, twenty twenty four. Um, so if you put in you know an application tomorrow, they won't even start. I mean, they'll look at it to give you a letter to say it's a complete application, but they're not going to start scoring. Uh, these applications till after um, March 31st. And, um, you know, we'll get into scores momentarily, but generally that, that time period between March 31st and understanding, you know, if you got the allocation could be anywhere from a couple of weeks to maybe eight weeks or more. Um, it will be before the next quarterly deadline. I can mostly assure you of that. But the USDA does their best that they can to get the application scored and funded in a timely manner. But like any other government program, you know, um, they're what they have limited resources and they're working, you know, as fast as they can. They have to be diligent and make sure everything, all the I's dotted T's across. So depends on how many applications they get you know, and how busy they are uh, of how long it could take you to get an answer. Um, Rhonda, did you want to uh, say anything about timeline, about how how, how quickly y'all score applications? Come in. Okay, I don't. Can you hear me, Jim? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so if you could go back to the to the competition. So we started the quarterly competitions, um, as you can see, quarter one ended June 30th of 2023. Um, based on when we received the applications and when we can fund them, that was in fiscal year 23. So 
quarter two ended September 30th of 2023, um, but those funds would actually come out of our fiscal year 24 budget because we would not be funding them until after October 1st. So as you can see, you have the, the note over to the side that says applications will automatically roll over to the next eligible competition if not selected. That starts with quarter two. So anyone that applied in quarter two, if we were not able to fund their application, their application can actually roll over and compete in three quarters. So they can compete all the way up to quarter five, which that competition period ends June 30th because those we would get funded before September 30th. However, the way they have it set up now, if your application is not funded by quarter five, I believe they are going to hold a national competition. So they'll pull in any money that other states did not use and your application compete, can compete for that national um, pool of money. If your application is not funded at that point, it has to be withdrawn. It, it, it's, it has competed in as many rounds as it can. If you have not started your project and you wish to be considered again, you would have to reapply to be considered for FY25 funding. So that's where uh, Jim was pointing out that you can start your project at any time after you get that complete letter, but you are proceeding at your own risk. So if you decided to start your project and you are not funded once you've met all the competition rounds, then you would not be eligible to reapply because you've already started your project. So that is kind of a catch-22 that each applicant will have to determine, you know, if they want to take that risk. All right, thanks, Rhonda. You made a, a great, um clarification to you on um, the fact that, you know, just because your your um, project is not funded this this one deadline or this one quarter, it will roll over automatically until the end of the fiscal year, like you like you said. So um so the now we get to how much uh, will the USDA fund. Uh, and for renewable energy systems and energy efficiency improvements, uh, they fund up to 50% of eligible project costs. And the limits here, if you look at the renewable energy systems, which are like your solar, wind, and, and whatnot, uh, they have a minimum grant request of a project of $10,000, and that could be a grant of 2,500. And they have a maximum request of 2 million, which a $2 million project would be a $1 million grant. So those are kind of your limits on the renewable energy systems. And on the energy efficiency improvement side, uh, there's a minimum project cost of $6,000 and a maximum of 1 million. So again, minimum $1,500 grant, maximum $500 grant. And those are your limits on energy efficiency improvements. And one thing to consider when you get to the upper limits of these uh, projects is the USDA, you know, they have a bucket of money, so they don't have an endless amount of money. Um, and the bigger the project, you know, I don't know if, I don't know how much money they have, but, um, you know, if you're asking for a million dollars from their budget, then a lot of their funds are probably going to go to one project, which they they like. I think they like to spread it amongst businesses if they can, you know, in South Carolina, so they can impact um, positively as many businesses and farms as possible. Um, just to think about on a strategic level, you know, just thinking about that. But you can apply for how within these limits you can apply. And fifty percent is pretty amazing. Um, they're going to pay for half of your project. Um, that's amazing. And then if you add in other incentives, which I'll discuss shortly after after we finish here, um, you know, it could, it could be very um, appealing. Uh, and, and it can make it could be feasible and make a lot of sense for your business or your farm. <clears throat> so let's say you got an eligible project, you're an eligible applicant. You know, everything's within the limits. 
and you get a complete application in, well, how do you know if you're going to get funded? Well, it's a competitive grant uh, process. And uh, so it is scored. Uh, so you have to consider uh, the scoring criteria. And it's become more competitive since they went up. It used to be 25% that they um, reimbursed. Um, you know, now it's 50%. So it's become more competitive. It's become like more appealing and more attractive. So demand has increased. So the scoring is, is going to be a consideration. Uh, so if you look at the scoring um, rubric that they submitted after April 1st, uh, I guess this is the current one they're using. 25 or 25 points or the bulk of the points is just based on the energy that you're going to generate, replace, or save. So it's pretty important to um, have a good, you know, um, savings. And uh, if you are a previous recipient or not, you can actually apply for this each fiscal year. Each fiscal year, you can apply. But your second application, you're going to lose points because you're you're not you're um, you were a previous recipient. So they're going to give extra points to first time uh, applicants. Um, length of payback period uh, that that's a function of the cost of your project divided by the energy that you're saving or replacing. Uh, so the longer that payback period, the lower your score is going to be. Commitment of matching funds, everybody's going to have to have matching funds. Um, environmental benefits, uh, you, I'll talk about those uh, shortly. And a change they made uh, to the criteria from the last time, they used to have size of request and whether you're an existing business or not. They did away with that. Now they have 15 points for projects located in disadvantaged or distressed communities. So what does this mean? Are you you want to know if you're in a disadvantaged or distressed communities? There are um, places that you can go to determine, you know, whether you're in one of these communities or not. Uh, this is one uh, map, interactive map that you can go to through this economic innovation group of distressed communities. And if you come down here, I'm in Orangeburg County, and if you look at Orangeburg County as a county score. We're 91.7, we're distressed county. Now, if you just go north a little bit and do Lexington County, they have a score of 9.6, they're a prosperous county. So that may impact your score depending on, you know, where the project uh, takes place. So what they're trying to do is, uh, you know, give some priority or preference to uh, distressed communities. Um, that need more economic development, improvement, upgrades to their areas. And then there's uh, always a state director administrative uh, discretionary points. And this is just a, um, this is talking about the scoring changes that I just mentioned, uh, that 15 points uh, would be allocated to these um, disadvantaged and distressed communities. Thank and you. This, Hey, yes. Mrs. Ken, can you go back to the previous slide and elaborate more on the length of payback, if you would? What is that really saying there? Oh, uh, length of payback? Yes, I'm going to go over the application, and I'm going to go on that a little bit more on the application. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yep. So I mentioned another 10 points is for environmental benefits. If you're wondering what, what are the environmental benefits and how do I get those points? Well, if your project is not produce greenhouse gases um, at the project level, you'll get five points. So you get half of those 10. Then you'll have to answer these five questions about your project. You know, does it does it not convert farmland? Uh, does it not contribute to deforestation and fire hazards and forest, forest lands? Is there a document of water conservation? Complies with EPA's renewable fuel standards and at least 25% of the project components are bio-based. And this uh, EPA's renewable fuel standards um, has to do with, um, well, I thought I had it pulled up, but it doesn't look like I do. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, let's see. Move it over. You can go to the EPA site and look at their renewable fuel standard. 
but basically the renewable, the RFS. It's a national policy that requires a certain volume of renewable fuel to replace or reduce the quantity of petroleum-based transportation fuel, heating oil and jet fuel. So you'll just kind of have to determine if your project you know, does this. Um, I don't think a lot of projects would, would fall under this, um, but it's something that you know, you'd have to look into. And then um, a bio-based is like plant-based or carbon-based type uh, project. So yeah, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that REAP has a guaranteed loan. Um, so it pays up to 75% of the project. You would go through typical underwriting criteria like any bank uh, to receive this loan. Um, you have to go through a lender so this is a guarantee. It's not a direct loan from the USDA Rural Development. It's a guarantee, which means you go to a lender that works with the USDA. That lender will do the underwriting, and then they'll work with the USDA to get the guarantee. So some important highlights. Um, no residential benefits allowed. Uh, you may have a shared meeting, metering device in some cases. Um, there's a, there's additional restrictions and possible installation of a second meter. So, you know, some farms, you know, might have residents attached to the farm somehow. So that's something that if you came across that issue that we would have to research and, and determine whether, you know, it's eligible or what the requirements would be, unless you're an ag producer, you must be in an eligible area, those areas that I outlined. Uh, REAP prohibits receiving more than 50% grant from a federal source. There are other federal programs that fund the same activities or the same projects. For example, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Services, their EQIP program has an energy, um, an energy uh, efficiency uh, component. So you couldn't apply for N NRCS and rural development and get the money for the same project um, or any of the federal source for that matter. Um, if selected, you have two years to complete the project. Uh, you will need to register in SAM and get your UEI number, which is your unique uh, identity, uh, or your unique entity identifier, UEI. And that process can take up to 10 days. Uh, so you don't wanna wait to the last minute before the deadline to get this information in either. Some people I've seen get the UEI back in a day. Some people I've seen, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, I don't know what, what makes the difference, but it does. Environmental documentation is very important, especially if you're going to break ground. If you have a project that's gonna break ground, there's gonna be additional uh, documentation required um, for a project. Um, applications over $200,000 are, are going to require additional documents. Um, so basically just three applications. Um, the first one goes up to 80,000. The next one's 80 to 200,000. And then the third application is over 200,000. And each application gets a little bit more complex. Uh, as you can imagine, you're asking for more money. They want more information. Uh, cause this is an investment by the USDA into your business and into, I guess, the environment as well. Um, get to know your state energy coordinators, uh, which Rhonda is on the call with us now. Uh, and also make sure we have the right forms. Um, they update these forms uh, from time to time. So ensure you have the right forms. If you work with me or another business consultants, we should be able to, to get those forms correct for you. Um, and they can be kind of difficult to access if you don't have Adobe, you have to have the right software to download them at times as well. Um, of course, you can contact your state energy coordinator, you can contact me. Uh, and there's some newer um, uh, technical assistants out there, uh, one being SCASED, uh, which uh, Ken Harvin is on the call with uh, SCASED in South Carolina. Association of Economic and Community Development. I hope I got that right. <laughs> um, but they all they also are providing technical assistance uh, at no charge 
if I'm not mistaken, on these grants. Uh, so we'll send that information out as, as well, where, where you can get resources to help. Um, I'm going to, before I end it, and feel free to put questions in the chat, I did want to go through the application because sometimes when you see the application, it it can be helpful because it answers questions that was not in my presentation. And a lot of times, which don't fall in presentations in general for one reason or another. But if you look at the application here, the first page is some basic information. This is where they're really checking eligibility. Um, you know, this is where you're documenting uh, that you're eligible. Uh, you've got your UEI you have to put there. You know, you're checking if you're agriculture producer, or rural small business. If you're a rural small business, then they want to know what's the NAICS and what's the corresponding size limit. Um, there's some descriptive uh, questions here uh, that are, you know, you're just kind of answering the questions, kind of evident um, about what your what is your project, who owns and controls, you know, the business. Um, you actually can get into more eligibility issues with ownership and control, depending on, you know, who's owning the business. But um, those are things that we try to help you, you know, suss through and 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 clarify. Then you get to your project types. It can be an energy efficiency improvement project, or it can be a renewable energy system. There's two types. There's non greenhouse gas, and then there's emits greenhouse gas. So you have to determine which one of these that you're going with. And this application that I'm going through is an under 80,000 application. So this would be the simplest application. Um, project description uh, here, and then you get into cost breakdowns of the project. And here you're gonna put your estimates um, that you've received from your vendors, and you have to go out and get these estimates um, from the vendor. So if you're getting, if it's a solar project, you need the, uh, you know, the broken down estimate from the solar. If it's energy efficiency, maybe you're replacing lighting, you're putting in automation, maybe you're putting in uh, an HVAC system as well. Um, well, each one of these, you need an estimate for each one of those. You also need, you know, specs on all those. You need information on their warranties. You need the brochure. You, you need all that stuff. All the supporting documentation to back up um, the claim or, or the the uh, the information that you that you want. So th this would go right in here. Uh, then you get down into uh, the bulk of where the score is really made, which is in the technical um, reporting uh, on the project. And this first section is for renewable energy systems. You can see like the first question they ask here is the amount of energy that is going to be generated by the project, right? They want to know that. Then you can get in some information about if you're going to net meter and sell uh, energy back um, to the grid or each other. And that's just a whole nother level of documentation that's needed uh, for that process. Um, this is a, this is a section on byproduct or other revenue quantity that, that might be made off the system. And then there's a block here on, so they want to know, well, how much energy is going to be generated from this renewable energy system, like a solar unit? And then what's your historical annual energy, average energy used, right? So this is all set up uh, to determine how much you're saving, you know, on this uh, system that's going to be installed. Uh, so they want to know how much uh, of this, how much did you use? And you're going to have to submit 12 months, at least 12 months. Um, of energy bills and an energy rate sheet uh, to determine, you know, the proper rate uh, that you're paying for energy now. And all of this uh, is basically calculated and they're going to determine, well, you know, if you're producing, and most of the projects that I see, the energy from a renewable energy system does not, you know, produce 100% of the energy needed. Um, so in that case, you'll, you'll find out how much, what percent is being replaced. Is it 30%, 50%, 70%? If it happened to be over 
of the energy that's produced from your solar system or your renewable energy system, um, then you're getting into an energy generation project and not an energy replacement project. Uh, and you can see there's a line for energy gener generation. And then your bottom line here, um, another part of the score, remember we talked about simple payback. Uh, so basically simple payback is a function of the energy that you're saving from the project divided by the cost of the project. And you'll come up with so many years, right? And does it take you five years uh, to pay this back? Um, and this is this is based on the gross estimate of cost before any incentives. Um, so the payback is based on the cost before incentives. So you're not applying any of these incentives that you get. Um, so if it took you five years versus 15, 20, 50 years, uh, your score will reflect, you know, a five year will be a better score than a 30 year payback, right? And in some cases, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if you're getting out to 50, 500 years or whatever um, on your payback, I mean, does that make sense? Maybe it does, because just because, you know, you are still saving, which is one of the requirements and you need maybe your other equipment is you know it's at the end of its useful life um or you know you just want a solar you believe in the environmental benefits of the solar system or that it's a value proposition and it's going to save you some electricity but everybody has different goals as to why they want this in the main thing with the usda is it has to, it has to show the savings and the savings you know the more savings there is the lower the payback the higher score you, you'll have all right, so that's renewable energy systems. You're also going to have other um, uh, qualified uh, people uh, in the project, one of those being a vendor. Um, you'll need uh, like a solar installer uh, and vendor. This person has to be a qualified individual. Um, and this is where you put all their credentials and their information. Um, if you are doing an energy efficiency project, you may also need, depending on the cost of the project, if it's under 80000 the vendor who is installing the project can perform an energy assessment. The energy assessment is going to determine how much energy you're saving from the project. Um, and that is that comes in the form of a technical report that is given to the USDA, which needs to um, align with USDA regulations. Um, so that person um, could be a vendor if it's under 80,000, or it could be a third party, uh, you know, engineer or energy assessor or some qualified individual that has certification or, or qualification to perform an energy assessment. Projects over 80,000 require that third party energy assessment. If it's over 200,000, then you need an energy audit, which should be performed by an engineer, uh, a qualified individual professional engineer. Um, there's a whole, whole list under the regulations of who's, you know, who who can do those reports. But mo usually it's an engineer or two uh, for an audit, uh, typically. So the names of these folks that you're working with would be, you may be working with multiple vendors, you know, if it's a complex energy efficiency project with different, you know, things, and, and that's fine. Um, and, you know, if they have licenses, you need their license numbers, you need all the different credentials, all this information from them. If it's under 80,000, um, the vendor, there's a vendor certification that will be, have to be signed on the assessment for energy efficiency upgrades. And this is a lot of information that I'm throwing at y'all. And I kind of know it pretty well. So, but to you, it's probably like drinking water from a fire hose, but just, you know, Remember the basics, and then you can ask me or Rhonda, you know, about the specifics when you start digging into a project. But I do like to kind of go over everything and, and, and let you see that kind of a, what, what goes into a project. Um, of course, you will have to uh, submit technical reports for the renewable energy systems. Um, here under number two, it says, Renewable energy system applications, the agency may require a feasibility study based on the scope of the project. So that it says they may 
require a feasibility study. So that is something that you will need to determine uh, based on what you're proposing. And before you get too far into it, it might be good to talk to the USDA to determine if a feasibility study is going to need to be required on this. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. It just depends. They have their, you know, their methods for determining whether they 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 need a feasibility study or not. All right, I'm going to go through this last portion with the energy efficiency improvements. Um, it's pretty straightforward here. Uh, this first part of the energy efficiency, you have this energy assessment or audit, and they will determine how much energy you use um, with the current system in place. And then they'll have to look at the proposed system, the replacements that you want to make, new lighting system, new HVAC system, whatever you're proposing, automation. <clears throat> so what it, what would the energy consumption be after? So all this, all these numbers are come out of the energy assessment or energy audit. And then once these numbers are determined, they can kind of come up with, um, you know, total energy cost minus uh, total energy cost for proposed, and you get a savings, like a gross savings amount or net savings amount. And then you say, again, same again, it's like you need a payback. So that's, again, a function of what's the cost of the project divided by the savings um, that you're going to get from the project and uh, you'll get a number of years that will take you to pay it back. Uh, here are those five questions um, that were in the scoring section that we went over on the env environmental benefits. Um, you know, they're asking you uh, these questions you have to answer, you know, as appropriate. <clears throat> this last section, this section here is pretty important, commitment of funds. You need to be able to show that you have access to the funds um for the pro to complete the project and that can be done in a number of ways you may have the cash in your bank account your operating account you may have it in a savings account you may have it in a retirement account it may be amongst five different accounts you have that you can cobble together and show yes i have access to all these funds and it would cover the cost of the project but you also may not have the access you might may not have the cash in your account in which case you can uh you know, go to the bank, get a line of credit, and they can give you a letter saying, hey, yes, we would extend a line of credit for this. Or you can go to get a bank loan um, where you can get a, an approval letter saying that they would, um, you know, cover this project. Um, and there's a lot of different ways, you know, to go about, you know, trying to prove that you have the funding uh, to cover the cost of the project. And that's another you know, thing the SBDC helps with. You know, if you didn't have the cash, so what are some strategies, uh, what are some avenues that we can go down to get the funding needed to support the project? So we're happy to do that. We know a lot of lenders, a lot of programs, USDA, non-USDA, um, that can help help with those funds. <clears throat> um, and then you have uh, a lot of certifications that you have to make, uh, additional forms that you would have to complete um, you know, to complete the project. It is a federal program. There's going to be a lot of paperwork, okay? And one of the things that I usually say about grants is free. I mean, grants are, uh, you have to put a lot of work into them, uh, including this administrative aspect. Um, so you just should kind of have that expectation. Uh, they're great, but you have to put some work in um, on the front side and the back side if you get the award. Uh, so just expect that this paperwork to be done. Um, I was, uh, I am also one to mention a couple of other uh, things that come up when I talk to clients about uh, energy programs in general and especially renewable energy like solar. There are tax credits available on the state and federal level. And tax, the way tax credits work is basically, you, you know, you make money uh, through your business. And you may or may not have a tax liability at the end of the year. Tax credits can be applied to tax liability, but I am not a CPA or a tax professional. And what I usually recommend, and everybody's situation is different, you know, when it comes to their tax liability um, and how tax credits can be applied to their individual situations. So I usually recommend talk to your CPA, your tax professional, whoever you work with, 
and have them look at the regulations and determine how this would impact your individual uh, situation. It could be very beneficial to you, especially if you have big tax liabilities. Um, it might, and, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, this can be applied over a period of years. Um, so, but you need a professional to actually go over that and see if it applies to you and, and how well it applies to you. Another, another question I get from time to time is other incentives from utility providers, such as Dominion Energy or Duke Energy, which are probably two of the bigger, uh, providers, um, in South Carolina. And then you have the cooperatives, the energy cooperatives. Especially in rural areas, you have energy cooperatives. So if you go to um, Dominion Energy's uh, website uh, and look up their small business um, services, uh, they do have programs for incent and that incentivize uh, these energy efficiency upgrades for lighting, for, for other pieces of equipment. And they actually, I know Dominion just came out with some new products for agriculture and farms, you know, to try to help farmers. Um, you have to be in Dominion's uh, service area to apply for those. And in some cases, you might be excluded from some of those programs. So you have to call and, and determine if, if you were excluded or not. Most small businesses are not. Um, some bigger manufacturers or bigger companies that use a lot of energy, sometimes they'll opt out of some of uh, Dominion's programs um in which case they might not be um eligible but you just have to talk to dominion but yeah look at dominion their programs are yeah a lot of different things it's definitely if you're going to make the improvement check them out uh whoever your ut ut utility provider is both duke and dominion usually have incentives the cooperatives are a little lagging in that area most cooperatives, in my experience, do not have incentives, incentives, but I would check with your individual cooperative because they're all different and they may have something, you know, special or featured, you know, during this time period um, where they want to help their members. Uh, so, yeah, I would definitely reach out to the cooperatives for those incentives. Mm -hmm.